So here we are. I'm Mariana Marx, Executive Director of Asimov's World Foundation, mm -hmm. an organization that Terry Rocket and I started in 2019, dedicated to advancing access to public health and safe water, and also promoting the balance between humankind and nature among indigenous and local communities. One of Asimov's goals is to stimulate conversations that can engage people and bring about positive change. So that's why we are here today with Sharman Russell, renowned author of essays, short stories, fiction, and nonfiction works that have won multiple awards and been translated to many different languages. Sharman is a professor in humanities at Western New Mexico University, and she also holds a bachelor in science in conservation and natural resources. Just this year, Professor Sharman released her latest book, Within Our Grasp, Childhood Malnutrition Worldwide and the Revolution Taking Place to End It. We're so happy that Charmin accepted our invitation to talk about this book, which offers an incredible, fresh, hopeful, and optimistic approach to the issue of world hunger. And we also have here Gary Shea, board member and a friend of Charmin's, steering the conversation. In case you don't already know about Gary, I'll introduce him briefly. Gary has been professionally involved in humanitarian work for over 45 years and has international experience overseeing health and education development programs and emergency response, responses. He serves on Asimov's board and is also a senior director for another NGO. Gary is also a great conversationalist, so I won't take up any more time with this introduction because we have a great conversation ahead. So Gary, please take it away. Thank you, Mariana, and, and thank, thank you, Sharman, for being with us today. It's really appreciated. Uh, you and I have had a chance to talk before, and I'm really glad uh, that you can be here with the Azimuth World Foundation. Uh, let me, I'll have a few questions and probably some follow-up as well. Uh, you begin your book within our grasp with some overwhelming facts uh, that one in four children worldwide suffer physical and mental, mental stunting. Then the book gives way to a history of the scientific and social solutions adapted to understand and solve this problem. Why did you approach the issue of world hunger this way? talking about the breakthroughs and evoking hope instead of what's often traditionally done by shocking the reader about this worldwide situation? Well, that's a great question. Um, well, I've been interested in this subject for a long time, you know, over 30 years, but I knew, uh, I knew that to talk about it, I had to tell a story. And this really is such a great story. I really do find it uh, wonderful that in the 21st century, we've made these kind of breakthroughs. Uh, we've, we've learned so much more by the end of the 20th century, how much vitamins and minerals work in the body. But, you know, as much as that, starting in this 21st century, we've learned this holistic approach. We've learned the importance of empowering women. We've learned the importance that it's not just about food on the plate. It's about sanitation. It's about disease. Uh, it's, it's about the smallholder farmer. It's about, you know, uh, infrastructure like roads and sustainable agriculture. I think we really, I think it's within our grasp because we really understand so much better what we need to do. And, and this is all, I think, come together in these last 20 years. Uh, so the, you said something about, you know, hope and, and the other thing and why choose hope? And, and why not shock and awe? The other thing that I think we have come to understand in the 21st century is a sense of respect. So part of what we're doing is respecting the parent, respecting uh, the people to kind of take charge of their own health and, and to care for their own severely malnourished child. This was a breakthrough to have this community-based care. But I think we're also starting to understand that we need to respect um, you know, the people within that community, their culture, their traditions. And, and so when we look at someone, we don't just see their problems. That's disrespectful. You know, so that shock and awe of looking at a continent like Africa or a country like Malawi, or even down to the personal, someone who's experiencing a problem in America like homelessness, and to just see the problem, that's disrespectful. 
So I, I didn't want to do that. And I think we have learned that, that, that um, we need to look at the whole person. And in Africa and Malawi, it's, they're just wonderful, uh, vibrant, you know, work being done by vibrant, interesting, smart people. Thank you for that. Just a question, you know, my own experience, I think you know that I work with Save the Children and I've also spent some time in Malawi. Can you talk a little bit about some of the best practices? You used the word respect. Uh, what are some of those best practices that you've had a chance to witness, whether in Malawi or elsewhere? Right. Uh, well, I saw a lot of them. I went to Malawi because I knew there are a lot of successful programs dealing with childhood malnutrition. And because it has this kind of history in childhood malnutrition, it was where some of cutting edge research was being done at the turn of this century uh, and where research is still being done. So the best practices I saw, one of them was a group called Soils, Food and Health communities. And they are founded on the principle of what they call participatory research, because they're also uh, social scientists from Canada and from Malawi. So they were listening to the smallholder farmers. They, they, they didn't move fast because they were listening all the time. They're getting back input. So for example, they were trying to uh, reduce childhood malnutrition through sustainable agriculture. That was great. They introduced more diverse crops. They introduced more uh, drought tolerant crops, more resilient crops, different ways of agroecology. But then by talking to the people, they realized, well, that wasn't really helping childhood malnutrition because they weren't working on empowering the women in the household. These women were just exhausted. I mean, they were, and, and these great new crops were kind of adding to their burden. So it was a process of looking holistically of listening to people and of kind of following their lead, not, not coming in with a lot of ideas that, that you thought would work and then you didn't engage in a dynamic. So that was one best practice is to work closely with the community and to listen and to listen to the women, um, you know, as well as the men to, to pay attention to what, what they needed and what they wanted. And just that listening, I know you visited other programs and other non-governmental organizations. Did you see that listening happening sufficiently after you had visited the organization you just mentioned? I think what I saw is people were really trying. So even uh, the big organizations like CGI, AR, CGR, who are introducing biofortified crops and who are introducing um, you know, new forms of agriculture, they started, they start having to listen because it fails if you don't. If you introduce a new crop, but then you don't have a way to get to the market, or there isn't really a market out there, then you, you haven't succeeded. So they've started having to listen to what the farmer needs, not just the crop, um, not just the nutrients, but also a way to live, to, to, to be sustainable in the sense that I can grow this next year and someone will buy it. I can grow it the year after and someone will buy it. Um, you know, I have a well that, that I can go get to so I'm not distracted by my children, uh, you know, with disease. I mean, they've learned they have to listen. And, and I, I really think they're doing it more and more because it's the only way to succeed. Different question for you. Uh, okay. You mentioned Steve Collins in Within Our Grasp. Uh, he was also responsible for coining uh, community-based therapeutic care, which he called the holy grail of humanitarianism. Did your perception of this approach change when you witnessed its application through so many different projects in Malawi? Did you start seeing glimpses of what a post-individualistic society could look like during your time in Malawi? Yeah, well, you know, community-based care is about kind of returning to build on some of the ideas we're doing, you know, respecting parents enough and empowering them to do some care in the home. Because in a very poor country, you have to, like Malawi, there aren't clinics everywhere. So it's respecting the parents, it's, it's enabling the community to have their own clinics, their own care, and not kind of look to this outside source, which is usually a westernized source. Uh, so that's the community part. Um, I think that in a country like Malawi and in a country like the United States, it is still about a balance. On one hand, we depend on our larger pool of resources. You know, we need government to provide 
basic social nets and, and basic health care and resources. But we also need to look at our local communities and care for each other and learn how to do that and, and do that um, in our own way. So it's that I think it's that constant balance between that larger pool of resources and that smaller pool of resources. And I'm, I'm going to say that um, it is about being post-individualistic and it's kind of post-obsessive individualistic, which is what some countries uh, like my own, America uh, has become in my opinion. Um, so it's kind of returning to a more normal sense that, that of course you need your community. And, and of course you have to respect people in the community because you need them, you know, you, we, we can't survive without that small community, but also we need the larger uh, community of the government, I think. And Malawians both definitely need both. And since I have you as a, a captive speaker here, <laughs> can you just share a little bit more about community-based therapeutic care for some of the listeners who may not, might not be familiar with it, how it operates and what are some of the best practices with it? Well, you know, it's partly a response. And again, this is a very 21st century story. Uh, throughout the 20th century, when, when there was famine, when there was severe malnutrition, uh, what, what Westerners would do in, as part of their aid was to come in and to build a centralized feeding center. And people had to come from all over to get to that feeding center to get, to get the food they needed and the help they needed. And, and this was an instinctive process, uh, an instinctive part of kind of Westernized medicine to give the best medicine possible and to kind of centralize it. But we discovered it wasn't really working that well. You're bringing people together. Uh, you were causing more illness and disease. You were making mothers travel very far from their homes. So it was just a, a model that wasn't working. So it was really kind of a, a, a big change for, for once we had this therapeutic food that we could hand out to mothers and fathers in this kind of convenient foil packet and has all the vitamins and minerals. Once we understood what to give severely malnourished children, we could give those packets of therapeutic food to mothers and fathers and they would take them home and they would care for the child themselves. This wasn't high tech, best quality, you know, best practice Western medicine as we understood it but it's what works, that's part of the community. And it's also building uh, health workers in a village, it's also building health clinics within a village. It's not about coming in, it's about uh, helping people build their own resources and, and become stronger within themselves rather than dependent on outside uh, you know, need, outside people. Also, as you talk about the community health workers, can you also describe the role they play in the community and linking them to the nearest uh, health clinic or health service? Well, you know, I, I met a lot of, I, I went through a, through a lot of programs, uh, you know, from women's care groups to, to clinics that were using, uh, giving out ready to use therapy few to uh, mothers of malnourished children to agricultural groups. And, they're almost all run by Malawians. So they're almost all run. So, and, and they often said, yeah, my, my, my parents were farmers, but I went to school and now I, now I have this job. So health workers are very much coming from the community. Uh, they've been educated, maybe over in a long way or even Blantyre or even going overseas, they come home and, and this is this is their work. This is their this is how they flourish by by earning money, but also by giving back to the community. They so I think it's organized differently all over, but it's kind of fractal. You know, I mean, the health worker reports to the clinic. The clinic is going to have a relationship with the larger hospitals. Um, they all need more capitalization. They all need you know better equipment and more of everything. They, so they're not independent now of that. Um, but, but they're working because they work within the community. They know the community. And I think, you know, sometimes when people probably talk to you or talk with me, they think that we have people going over from the US or Europe working in all these countries. If you could just comment on who does the bulk of the work and a little bit about, you know, we'll get to this again later as well just the role of international organizations to support these local efforts. Right, I, th I think, you know, there's a new term out now, decolonizing aid. 
And, and I think what it's about is um, that international organizations understand, I hope more and more, that eventually they need to become, they need to, they need to stop existing. They need to give up their jobs to the, to the local people and to the local government. Um, and so what I saw is a lot of Malawians doing the work. I did see, and I think this was uh, kind of beautiful and fun. I did see a lot of graduate uh, uh, students from other countries, from you know America or from England, coming to train, you know, coming to learn, and that was a wonderful exchange. Just as we have people from other countries come to ours, ours are going there and and learning, you know, training in the field. So so that 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 was sweet. You. You wrote in your book that you felt simultaneously in deep waters and familiar ground in Malawi. Would it be fair to say that one of the most significant contributions you can offer within, uh, within our grasp is a bridge between these different disparate realities? And did writing the book uh, enable you to offer that bridge? Uh, the word disparate realities is a really nice one, that phrase. Uh, absolutely. Um, I had been a long time, you know, away from that kind of world, uh, living in rural New Mexico uh, in my own life, my own kids, my own, my own career. And, and I really wanted to, to, go, to go back to that world and to bridge that disparate reality of myself and, and to bring my readers along. Um, it is very striking to go to a place where, and this is just be a personal example for me, where women have to work so hard uh, just to do the daily chores, you know, to, to, to fetch water, to, you know, enough water to, to clean some clothes, to clean some dishes, to, to just, um, you know, the amount of toil and labor to, to raise children and then to compare that with my own life. That, you know, that, that's an important thing, I think, to remember how different other lives are. And then at the same time, to remember how familiar, how, how familiar it is to, you know, the affection you show a child and, and, and the way you talk with your, you know, husband or wife after, after you know, dinner or, and, and to meet people who are so different from you in some ways, but in other ways are so alike and you like them and you respect them and you admire them. And then you also meet people who you don't like, you know, whose behaviors annoy you just like they do anywhere. But the point is they're specific people. They're not abstract. They're, they're specific real people. And that means a lot. And you'll, you know, you carry that uh, for a long time. Can you tell us, uh a bit of a story about one of those people who may have inspired you or just persisted and <laughs> just just one example i think it would be nice to share uh yes and and the one uh, there are many who come to mind but but one of them i've kept communicating with fanny fanny chambaya and uh she she's uh 36 she has two uh two grown children and a granddaughter she's a policewoman so she managed to get enough education to to become a policewoman working with uh, teenagers, but but what I knew Fanny is going to her women's group. She has a little microfinance women's group because she's always doing extra things outside her work for her community. This microfinance group is just one. She also teaches children English, and you know she's just always busy working working to make her community better. So and to be part of it. So we all get together, uh, and I join the the woman for their microfinance group, and they tell their stories, and and everyone gives a little bit. I mean, they really give like a dollar a week, and then they pool that, and uh, then someone has twenty dollars to put into a small business you know, maybe to buy some flour to make some bread and sell it. And so that's the way that they're kind of supporting each other. So, um, you know, Fanny was just one of those people who instantly make you feel at home. You know, she's just so warm and, and it's very physical and you're, and you're hugging. And, and we all know people like that who instantly, they're just so um, gregarious and, and confident in themselves and friendly and and uh, that certainly goes across cultures. We all know that, that person who makes us feel welcomed. At, at this point, do you think the final stretch to end malnutrition is more dependent on political resolve 
or on the bill or on the ability to offer the right kind of solutions such as are you tf snacks and i'd like you to explain that to people through a market-based approach well yeah so i'll explain that you know the ready to use therapeutic food uh, uh, came as a way to treat severely malnourished children this was about the end of the 20th century when we were just sending malnourished children to hospitals and half of them were dying because we really were refeeding them the wrong food and we're refeeding them too much food so this ready to use therapeutic food is is just the right amount of vitamins and minerals it's just the right of calories um it's convenient it doesn't need to be mixed with water etc i can go home so some people believe um steve collins being one of them that this food should be available to everyone, to all parents, cheap, fortified snack food that they could feed their children before they got malnourished, and that they could just go buy in the marketplace, that, that this natural uh, human activity of making and buying and selling should be part of solving childhood malnutrition, you know, the role of the, of the private enterprise and of the market. And I think that's a great idea. But I think all those other things are important too. You know, laws that protect women from, from uh, domestic violence or that give them property rights, laws that regulate food safety, infrastructure, sanitation, all those other things I talked about. So I think kind of an answer to the beginning of your question, we already have the solutions. I mean, pretty much. We pretty much know what to do. So at this point, it is political will because those solutions are gonna require an investment. I mean, the start of anything big like this requires some financial investment and resources. And so we need the political will to spend the money, which is you know, not very much when you consider the reward. I think they say that for every dollar you invest in nutrition, you get you know, 16 back. And, and it's really clear that, we're, that we are, it's costing us a lot to have all these malnourished children, to have a fourth of the next generation not, not be productive, not flourish. So we know there's a huge economic benefit. So when, yeah, political will, spend the money, just say, let's do it, let's end it. I mean, people think we could do it in 10 years. I mean, and, and not people like me, but people in you know, the UN and people in uh, you know, global organizations. We know what to do. We have the wealth to do it. Yeah, the political will. Let's just do it. I mean, that would be so wonderful. The next question is, COVID-19 has taught all of us a lot. Uh, if we are to do it, just as you said, just do it. Just do it. What do we take away from COVID-19 and what role do the UN organizations, the international non-governmental organizations, and of course, all the national organizations that in many places exist, not always in all the remote areas, but there are obviously people there. So what does COVID-19 uh, yeah. add to what we all have to do? Right, right, right. Well, of course, as COVID-19 started uh, in my life and I saw it unfold, I thought, oh no, like, like I'm sure everyone uh, working in aid, this is really going to increase hunger. This is terrible. This is going to set my, you know, our desire to end child hunger in particular. It's really going to set it back. And to some extent, yes, of course, you can you can read all the numbers of how uh, the pandemic increased hunger worldwide, uh, partly just because of countries having economic downturns because of the pandemic, and, and then also the addition of disease. So that's absolutely a fact. Hunger has increased because of the pandemic. But as the pandemic started to unfold, what I also saw is the other lessons it was teaching us, that spending money on global health is really a good idea. It benefits all of us. And also that we have, I, I knew this before, but it really came home with the COVID-19 relief packages. We have a lot of wealth. We have money to spend. Um, and so, you know, the, what, what they, they're thinking now is we could end the majority of hunger in the world, not just childhood hunger, but the majority that's not caused by conflict and war with an additional $33 billion a year for 10 years. And then in 10 years, 
we would we would end it. Uh, we would have done a lot. We would have you know uh, had a tremendous feat. Well, at this point, thirty three billion doesn't seem like that much. I mean, think of how much we're spending, you know, with the uh, with the one point you know trillion infrastructure package, and also think of how much wealth uh, corporations have made during the pandemic. We're just seeing, you know, some companies have huge amounts of money which they could use they could spend on ending childhood malnutrition. I mean, it, it's, it's good for them, it's good for everyone. So not to go on too much, the pandemic taught us how important it is to spend on global health. And it taught us how relatively easy it is. You know, again, it's kind of, hey, you can do this. Earlier, you mentioned soils, food and healthy communities. And in your book, you cite them for their listening and you identify them as being a really world-class organization. Can you tell us a little bit about what they do to address behavior change, which is always a big part of uh, public health interventions, and also social mobilization? If you could just touch on those two and give us all you know, practical examples of how they go about this and its importance to the field. Yes, right, right. So uh, in their story, after they uh, had all these wonderful agricultural innovations, um, and then they did the home visits, and the woman said, well, that's great, that's great, but, but we're not feeling it at the home. We just have more work to do. And so they realized they had to work with relationships in a family. They had to help men understand that they need to help with bake, with child care. They had to help with cooking. They, they, had to, they had to share those household chores more because the women were really too exhausted to breastfeed, too exhausted to um, you know, uh, uh, feed their children multiple times a day, too exhausted to do the child care practices that, that we know are best. So it's a great question, Gary, because it's another example they, they asked, they said, well, I guess more home visits. And the woman said, no, the home visits aren't working. The men just disappear. What we need are public events. We need to have these joyous celebrations where we get together and we dance and we sing and we clap and we do our traditional um, uh, cultural forms of, of, of meeting and celebration. And the men want to come to those. And that's what they start doing. And they also start having these recipe days where there's this kind of competitive, you know, who could produce the best dish and the men start coming to those. So it was a, an example of listening. What's going to work best? Well, in our culture, not going home and reading about it and not, not having these home visits, but doing it publicly and doing it with, um, and they started having community theater where they would act out um, cultural changes and social changes. You can get those on, you can get one of those on YouTube, you know, go find their community theater uh, from Soils, Food and Healthy Communities. So they listened to the community who said, this is the best way to change our behavior. We know, we know how we are, you know, listen to how we're doing it. In America, it would be different. You know, we need to change our cultural behavior around junk food. You know, if you walk in any gas station, it's just like, wow, I can't believe we have so much um, processed empty calorie food available so easily. But it wouldn't be maybe the same way. We would do it differently. And, and so that's an example. When you met Malawi's a smallholder agroecologist, What's you, what surprised you the most about their ability to integrate knowledge about the soil and land with social, social and cultural aspects of their own community's life? Well, I, I think one of the things that surprised me, of course, is that this is um, new information to them. Um, so historically, and I did this research carefully, historically, Malawians were really well known as, as uh, agro-ecologists agro agroecologists by in the sense that they had all these micro environments in their gardens and they grew many diverse crops and they were kind of master gardeners. And early on when, when crops from the new world came over to Africa, they, they integrated them into this diverse cropping that they had. 
with colonialization, when, when the British came to Malawi, uh, farmers were really uh, more than encouraged to, to do a monoculture, just to rely on maize for, and that they could export. So for over 100 years, these smallholder farmers in Malawi have moved away from their tradition of agroecology and diverse crops. So this is new material. This is this is new about intercropping and and shading and trees and multiple crops, etc. So that surprised me. But of course, what they were doing is adapting to it very quickly. You know, it's it's kind of in their heritage, and they were adapting to it through what I what I've already said through through uh, song and and dance and and public celebration and and also of course you just you know look at the fact that you have more food for your children, more food for your family, more income. So they're smart people. Um, they're, they're, they're listening very hard to some of this, you know, quote, new information that's coming to them. In Within Our Grasp, you talk about social enterprises and social initiatives by corporations. Could you talk a little bit more about the distinctions between both of those and what's your aspiration those areas in the future. I, I have a lot of aspiration for social enterprise. Um, so social enterprise is essentially any business that is also engaged in the social good. So that's quite a spectrum. Uh, and on one end of it is, you know, the corporation who has a million dollars supporting a low, you know, a city symphony, you know, who does something, you know, that's for the good. Um, the problem is if that corporation is also promoting a lot of things that aren't for the good, you know, so there's kind of a dissonance between their business and the social good. Um, at the other end of the spectrum is the social enterprise that is totally committed to, to say, solving childhood malnutrition and does products that reduce childhood malnutrition and pours all their money back into that. But really, there's all those things in between, you know, the, that's just a continuum. Um, I, I really think that all the people who become nurses and, and aid workers and teachers and, and policemen and firemen, all the people who choose a livelihood that works directly with the social good, they're kind of a form of social enterprise. I, because I think basically people want to make their living in a way that also makes their community flourish. We feel good about that. We feel good we can combine these two great needs that we have to make a living and raise our family and to live in a flourishing community and help them. So the future I hope to see is one in which we really encourage social enterprises more and more across the spectrum. You know, there's just not one right way of doing it, but more and more we, we um, support not only in our country, but when we're giving uh, our resources, our pooled resources to, to other places to support that idea of, of businesses and enterprises and, and, and work that also, you know, returns to the community. Can you talk a little bit more about the role of women in some of these social enterprises that you've observed, Sane? Well, I can give you the statistic that that in Africa, you know, there it's it's fast growing entrepreneurial stuff. I mean, people are starting businesses all the time. Uh, fastest grow, growing in the world are you know African small businesses, and of those, women are the majority. And women often start a small business because they want to raise money to send their children to school. You know, that's a primary need, you know, for them. So yeah, women have a lot of motivation to, to start a business. Just like Fanny, um, she also, you know, as well as being a policewoman, she baked bread at night. She was one of the few houses in her community in Malawi, Lalongwe, Malawi, that had electricity. It's kind of erratic because of power shortages. So at night she would bake bed, bread and then she would sell it. And that was specifically for her daughter's university fees. So again, women uh, are, are eager to get out there and to, and not only for them to flourish, but they're also eager for their children to flourish, to get an education. And, and they, they need to go into business to do that. Again, in Malawi, you were there with Carl Wald visiting mobile health clinics. Uh, and you came across a communications office from the St. Louis Nutrition Project filming a clinic with yeah. mothers and their children. And then you yeah. talked about 
the ethics of shaping art or a book from the pain of children. And you said the justification for it is connecting people and pain in the context of hope. I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that because that could happen with any number of organizations coming across. Just share that a little bit, uh, just to amplify that a bit. Well, of course, what you're talking about a bit is my struggle, uh, which I dealt with as a writer, of being a white woman from a wealthy country and, and writing about uh, a, a poor country, going into that country, uh, mostly people of color. Um, and, and who was I to do that? So I, I struggled with that. And that section you're quoting is a little bit of that. And I struggled with, um, I had written about hunger before. And in that book years ago, I had chosen not to go to a famine because um, I didn't want to be that person on the plane who wasn't a nurse, who wasn't a doctor, who was just the writer. Um, this time I knew I really had to get closer. I had to go to the clinics. I had to, I had to be closer to the story. So that statement is kind of watching me struggle with it. And, and throughout the book, I try to be transparent with the reader, a little bit about my own struggles. Um, but what I saw that, that film director do is connect uh, pain with hope. And, and of course, I find this such a hopeful subject because I, I've seen all the people trying so hard. I've been inspired by the number of people in every country working, working to resolve this. I'm inspired by kind of the wonder, the science behind and the wonder of the human body. That's something that personally interests me. Um, and of course, I'm inspired by the fact that we can do this. I, I wouldn't be drawn to this subject if I didn't find it hopeful. Um, I think hope engenders action. I know that writing engenders action um, and, and writing about hopeful subjects certainly engenders a kind of action. Uh, hopelessness does not. You know, hopelessness leads to kind of apathy and, and distress and you know, almost a mental illness. But hope leads to a sense of action, movement, momentum, uh, forward, and you know, eventually, in this case, I think solutions. You know, right now, there's a lot of focus on climate change. And there are also projections in the future of a vast increase in the number of people who will be climate uh, internally displaced persons or climate refugees. How do you feel that the field of nutrition can best address this? Because the projections of number of people is significant increases by the year 2050. And the most vulnerable, of course, will be the youngest children. Right. If you had all of those resources that you mentioned before, what would you be doing about now to try to mitigate uh, the impact of this? Well, you know, I, as a writer, I've written about two things. Uh, nature, I'm best known as a science and nature writer, and hunger, you know, and so this book, brought those two interests together. Um, so I've long been interested and concerned about climate change. And what I wanted to do in this book is really emphasize that the role that the desires of the humanitarian and the environmentalist are aligned. So I think that solving childhood malnutrition is absolutely going to be about uh, mitigating climate change. You know, it reduces population growth. It's directly connected to sustainable agriculture. You know, it's, it's everything we both want. We both want that same thing. The question you're asking is, is a difficult one because you can't just say, I, I'm drawn to, I'm a pragmatist more than someone just associated with hope. Pragmatically, I think we can end childhood malnutrition just as others do, you know, say within 10 years by spending money and doing the right things. Um, pragmatically, I think hope is the best way for us to take those actions. Climate change is a more intractable problem. Um, conflict and wars are more intractable. I'm not so sanguine about those. Similarly, I think hope is the only solution. I mean, how, how if you're going to feel hopeless about climate change, you're not going to take action. And so I think there's a lot of things we can do. It goes again that um, it's not a pie situation. We don't just have the money to do climate change or just the resources to do childhood malnutrition. If we move forward and in 10 years, 
everything we do to end childhood malnutrition in terms of agroecology, sustainable agriculture, empowering women, empowering smallholder farmers, um, you know, having a quarter of the generation uh, uh, be healthy physically and mentally, all of that is only gonna help our resilience towards the changes that climate change brings. It's not going to solve those problems, but it's only going to help. And in the meantime, we'll be at such a much better place to deal with those uh, climate change problems. We could just do that in the next 10 years. We'd be much better positioned to deal with all the additional problems that climate change is going to bring. Uh, that's the way, that's the only way I can think about it. Let's go ahead and do this. Let's also work at climate change at the same time. And most of what we do with childhood malnutrition is related to working towards climate change mitigation. Uh, in listening to you and having had a chance to review your book or look at your book, uh, <laughs> you have an exceptional capacity of hope. Uh, how do you maintain that hope? And how do you share that with your students? Well, you know, I thanks. Thanks for saying that. Um, you know, as I've said, I, I, I think I'm pragmatic. I, I, as a nature writer, I've written, uh, uh, so nature is life and death, predator and prey, competition and cooperation. It's, it's so rich and, and it's not about hope so much, it's just about what is. Um, childhood malnutrition is a subject that I can be particularly hopeful about. I'm not hopeful about everything. Um, I do think hope is the pragmatically the best way forward if a problem requires action. Um, you know, we get up each day. It's a mystery each day. Uh, as as each part of our life, you know, we we're we're faced with with new mysteries and new problems. Um, so I use writing a lot to process and to think and to I think people think of writing as a way of just thinking intellectual, but it's also a way of feeling. I've learned a lot about my own feelings um, and about um, who I am in the world through writing. So that's what I tell my students because they're writing students. I say, you know, look, look to your craft, look to your art, look to your, uh, this, this huge part of your connection to life and, and, and explore it and use it. You know, over the last two years, it's been difficult for almost two years, it's been difficult for people to travel, including many students who want to work and gain that practical experience that you've had over your lifetime and so many people have had. Um, how can we help these people have these young students or older students have this opportunity to have some of the same experiences that you've had? You know, maybe, <laughs> and this just occurred to me right now, Gary, because this is kind of a fresh conversation in some ways, is maybe it goes back to what we were saying before. We need to listen to them. We should go to those students and say, well, tell us, how can we help you have these experiences? Is, is you know, is Zoom working for you? I mean, do you feel, you know, connected when you see media about these other places? Or is that not enough? Do you want to do this through college? Do you want it a paid gap year like some, you know, uh, countries have? How, how can we connect you more to, um, to the rest of the world and, and to, you know, your desire to understand and, and be engaged in the rest of the world. And, you know, I can think of answers, but they're the answers of, you know, someone who was born in 1954. What we need are the answers of someone who was born in, dare I say it, 2000. How, you know, that, that would be a great, uh, you know, thing to do to ask them, I think. A question I had for you, Again, you've seen international NGO, national NGOs, UN organizations. How, how would you suggest organizations go about calibrating the time period uh, that they work in the community to avoid any type of dependency? What would be some of your guidelines if you would, if someone asked you to share them? I'm asking you to share them. You know, 
I happen to know that you would be the person to answer that question, not me, that you've had a lot of experience uh, working with NGOs and with, gui with guidelines and with dependency. And I haven't really. Um, my instinct would be that it'd probably be case to case. You know, it would be what, what problem they're working on and um, what resources they got from the national government, how long they needed to be there. <laughs> I know you remember that uh, just last year, the Nobel Prize for Peace went to WFP, the World Food Program, which definitely provides life-saving life food assistance to millions across the world. Uh, tell us your thoughts on this. How do you see the relationship between food and peace? Well, that I, I thought that was a pretty um, uh, discerning and appropriate award in a lot of ways, because obviously food is connected to peace and to recognize, you know, the efforts of, of promoting nutrition and, and food for everyone. That, that meant a lot. Um, I, I guess I go to the word flourishing, that, uh, you know, if, if, if you're not flourishing, if your children aren't flourishing, uh, your community isn't flourishing, uh, your country isn't flourishing, you know, how, how can you have peace? How can you sustain peace when people aren't flourishing? When, when, when their children are hungry and their children are in pain, um, when, when their children and you yourself are, are, um, are tired and anemic and, and unhappy, emotionally uh, unhappy and angry too. So all of those things, when you have when you have a, a, a human being and a family and a society that that is flourishing and that has the capacity, the ability to reach its full potential, the opportunity to do that, then you have, I think, the foundation of a sustainable peace. When you don't have that, you know, you're you're gonna, you're not going to have peace. At Azimuth World Foundation, we're committed to contributing to ending human wildlife conflicts that often have imp negative impacts on both sides of this equation. Can you tell us, share with us how ending childhood malnutrition is a good step uh, toward helping us solve this type of conflict? Yes, yeah, I, I have a chapter about that in the book because again, the book is partly about showing how the goals of the environmentalist and the goals of the humanitarian are aligned. That's true in population growth, that's terms in sustainable agriculture. And I think that's true in wildlife too. Um, and so there's lots of statistics of, of how, uh, you know, if you, have a, if you have a park, you know, that, that is protecting uh, certain endangered wildlife, but it's surrounded by families who are hungry and poor, um, it, you know, it's just too hard to do to, to end poaching or to stop. Um, or to stop the, the wildlife too from encroaching on the families. I mean, it's, it's a constant struggle to try and maintain these pockets of wildlife against um, hungry people and poor people. So we know that, but, and I, and I will just say that, so once you have people who are flourishing, I'll go back to that word, remember on a planet of 7.8 billion people. So there really are people almost everywhere. Once they're flourishing, then I think uh, you can allow for biodiversity to flourish and you can protect and, and um, have your wildlife flourish more. I have lived 40 years now in rural New Mexico, right by a huge 3. million you know, acre national forest. And so I've worked as an environmentalist here uh, for, for that long. For an example, we've had a really hard time reintroducing the Mexican wolf because ranchers feel that it threatens their, their livestock uh, and to some extent their livelihood. Well, if, if, if I look at those years of problems with reintroducing the Mexican wolf, and then I think of people whose children are going hungry, who are struggling just to survive, then that really brings home to me that if people feel threatened uh, by wildlife, wildlife will lose. Um, but if people feel that they are flourishing and that wildlife can even contribute to their sense of, of flourishing, their sense of well-being, which wildlife certainly can, we know that, um, then, then everyone, then it's a win-win, then it will work. A question that I should have probably asked right at the beginning, what inspired you to do this type of work, this writing in this field? What 
Was that something you always wanted to do? How did you get involved in your lifetime career? Well, I uh, was a teenager in the 1960s. So there was that cultural, uh, uh, you know, instinct to civil rights, women's rights, uh, the social good. Um, I got a degree in conservation and natural resources. And, and so I, I, I assumed I would always write about environmental problems, you know, that, and, and as I said, I've mostly been a nature and science writer. Um, I did go to India at a, at a you know, my 20s, and, and that made a huge impression on me. And, and it kind of goes back to helping uh, people get out of their comfort zone, you know, go to new places, see, see disparate realities, as you were, as you were saying. I will say that my interest in hungry children happened very viscerally when I was pregnant with my uh, first child. And, you know, you've, as a, you just feel this aggrandizement that, that you're suddenly the mother of all children, <laughs> responsible for all children. So, so it opened that gate, that sense of full responsibility as an adult for the children of the world. And I never, I, that, that never went away. So that was 37 years ago. Uh, so I continue to, to write books about that, uh, one book in particular, and then to keep returning to the subject. And, and this is one of my returns. And I assume I'll return again at some point uh, because it's, it's kind of a, if I feel anything, <laughs> I feel we have the responsibility to feed our children. And more than that, the privilege you know, we have the privilege, the joy of, of feeding our children. Uh, so that's an emotional, uh, that's the emotional depth from which it comes, I think. Well, I'm going to turn it back to Marianne in a minute, but I want to thank you so much for sharing your experience. And we hope uh, the next time you write another book, we'd love to have, <laughs> we'd love you. to have you for round two. But let me turn it back to Mariana because I didn't ask all the questions and maybe she has a couple more. Well, first, I would like to thank you both for this such profound and insightful conversation and for having, Sharman, for having the time to, you know, to be here with us and have this such important conversation. And I hope our, our viewers will understand more about the importance of the issues that you address in your book, in particular malnutrition in Malawi, but also that they have this sense of hope so maybe my, my just final question will be, you know, has as individuals in different societies, um, how can we, how can we help? You know, the first thing I think of is vote, you know, support leaders who understand the interconnectedness of the world, who understand that we're all in this together at this point, you know, and so, and who care who care about other people. Um, so that we, we, we wanna have leaders and we wanna vote for them. Um, I think there's so many good organizations in terms just of childhood malnutrition, there's so many good organizations and they need your financial support as well as your emotional support. My, my personal advice is to choose the one that appeals to your imagination and stay with that one. Uh, so if, if you really care about child hunger in America and, and school lunch programs, find the local one and, and give to that. If you care about policy, find the, the policy, you know, the, the organization that deals with policy. If, you're, if your heart goes out to children who are suffering right now, you know, then go to the organizations that are dealing with famine right now in Yemen and in and Ethiopia and all the places where children or literally right now suffering. If you like the long-term sense, and if the idea of agroecology appeals to you, go to an organization like Soils Food or Healthy Community, uh, go to your organization, the one that, you know, that you're working with. If you, if you care about the interaction between wildlife and, and people, give to that organization. But find the one that, that you can connect to personally and then keep supporting it and supporting it and supporting it and supporting it, you know, um, because we should redistribute some of our wealth. I mean, one of the things that's really clear to me in Malawi is Americans, I'll speak as an American, produce like, you know, 
you know, 18, you know, metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions into the air a year, and Malawians produce 0.1. I, we owe them. <laughs> That's how I think of it. We have a responsibility to, um, to, to share and spread the resources that we have. I couldn't agree more, Charmin. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I think Gary will also as a just a final and very important question to ask you before we end our conversation. Sharman, thank you so much for sharing so much with all of us. Uh, where can people purchase your book? Right. Well, of course, on Amazon. Uh, indie bookstores, local bookstores, probably not. <laughs> you can order it. Um, so it's it's online and and um, write me, Sharman Russell. <laughs> if if you know uh, I'm 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 really interested in getting it out to the readers who who care about the subject and want to learn more. So ask your library to to um, to buy it. That would be one way of doing it too.